was recorded on the day before we go for our 19th tour and visit to China on the 25th of March 2024. We first went to China in spring of 1996 and then back in 2002 for the first serious academic visit and almost every year since then we have visited until Covid and after Covid we went back last October in 2023. This constant visit to China raises the question of why do we do it and what do we find? I originally went to China because a friend suggested it, Jerry Martin, and I'd already worked in Japan and found that fascinating, but knew that there was this new challenge, this new civilization to discover, about which I knew nothing really, hardly anything. I was in the position of many of my colleagues who roughly have an idea of where China is, but if you ask them any details about it, such as the names of emperors or writers or important events, um, or let alone what it's really like, never having visited and not having read much and not been educated at school about it, they know nothing really. And I knew nothing, but my wife and I went and enjoyed our tourist trip enormously and subsequent visits have been extraordinary. It's very late in my life. The serious visits began in my 60s and now I'm in my 80s. But trying to encompass a new civilization during this age is enormously stimulating and I think important. The importance is in various ways. One is the obvious fact, which has become ever more apparent, and particularly in the last two or three years, that the world order is being reshaped and there is a swing away from the dominant area, that is the Anglosphere, Britain, America and Europe, to the rest to the south and the east, to India, Africa, and above all, to East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and so on. So we are going to be, in the next few years, as we are already, hugely influenced by that part of the world. And in order to avoid paranoia and suspicion and anxiety and confusion, it seems helpful to try and understand it. As an anthropologist, I tried to understand a number of societies as I taught. Uh, I'd done a lot of work in Nepal and worked um, a little in India and also taught on Europe and other parts of the world. So I knew that the anthropologist's mission is to go to a very different world, a different culture and society and political system, get inside it, listen to it, talk to the people, try and suspend your disbelief and your prejudices for a while, and listen to another voice, and then to come back to your own society and attempt the impossible, which is to translate often totally alien thought and feeling systems into a, a language which people around you can roughly understand. In some ways it's a, a voyage into another parallel world, a magical land where they do things very differently, if you like it, something like Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass, going there, finding this alternative world and then coming back. Now, it might be thought that China and Japan are now so modern 
um, so influenced by the West that it's not very difficult for us to understand them and that they are roughly as we are in many ways. Their political, economic, social systems have adapted to the West. Their cities are huge and not in basic terms apparently very different from our cities. Their education, their health systems, all this seems sort of familiar. That is true, but what interests me and anthropologists is what lies beneath that surface. And my experience in going to Nepal was an immediate shock of difference because this was a mountain village in the Himalayas where it was clear that everything that I'd taken for granted, my family system, my way of earning a living, and above all my religious beliefs were challenged by the villagers there. When you come to Japan or China, the shock at first is not so great because the surface is, as I say, quite familiar. What happened though is that as I spent more time in Japan, I discovered a parallel old ancient shamanic world as described in my book, Japan Through the Looking Glass. And that experience prepared me for the same gradual experience. It doesn't happen straight away in China. Visit after visit came up with shocks. Fortunately, um, my experience in China was mediated through a number of very intelligent former students and friends of mine because I don't speak or write Chinese and therefore surveying this vast ancient civilization so diverse in every way would be impossible without a great deal of help. But with my friends and students, Sarah and I traveled more or less the length and breadth of China. The area we didn't visit was the northwest, Xinjiang, Gansu, and the extreme north and the extreme south, Hainan. But 75-80% of China, um, at least uh, not the West, Tibet and so on, we've been to. And at every level, it's not a matter of going to just the great cities of Shenzhen or Wuhan or Chengdu or Beijing or Shanghai, fascinating though they are. It's not just a matter of going to the smaller cities, one, two million people, often again very different from the big cities, but going to small villages, going to the minority areas, particularly in the southwest, uh, lots of areas of the Dong and the Miao and the Da Tai and other ethnic minorities, a hundred million of them in China, and sometimes staying in people's homes, but certainly wandering around um, the villages, the markets, the fields, filming, photographing, taking diaries, and above all, talking to people. So gradually, I formed a picture, and this picture was of an alternative to everything that I've been brought up to believe. It's a family system based on the ancient clans, its economic system not based on the original capitalist system I was used to, its political system based on one party, um, bureaucratic uh, hierarchies, administrative hierarchies, its social system not based on the class system I was used to, and above all its philosophical systems, mixtures of uh, Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, um, animism. All these were totally different. And each of them worked. China has held together for uh, over 2,000 years in its rough present shape. The, it's preserved its extraordinary ancient art systems its writing systems and its philosophies 
in the face of constant uh, incursions from Mongols and Manchus and the West. And therefore it's clear that whatever it is that it lies beneath it works and holds it together. And so what we have and what gives me great interest is a Western world of which I was familiar, having been a historian and written a lot about Britain and a certain amount about British Empire in the West, and then going here and finding parallel and different worlds which give alternative solutions to many of the world's problems. And this is one of the things that really interest me. During the last 40 years or so, these um, eastern countries and much of Africa and elsewhere have been flooded with Western technologies and Western ways of doing things, medicine, education, uh, transport and so on, and they've absorbed them. But in return, very little of the ancient treasures, as it were, of organization and thought, experiment, discovery of those other worlds has come back into Europe. It's a rather different situation to that which one would have found um, in the 18th century in Europe when um, Chinese and Japanese things flooded in and there was a great passion for the art and tea and other things coming from the East, silk and porcelain and the rest. Now we flood in Chinese goods, objects, um, and to a certain extent some of the technologies um, of uh, greening the world and other things, uh, and even computers and cell phones are now influencing us. But the deeper things of China, the ways of addressing life's problems, haven't greatly influenced us. But I think we can learn a great deal. Even if we decide in the West not to adopt um, some of what we find, it's useful to see the alternatives. So for me, China acts rather like um, a science fiction or a utopian novel. It's a bit like reading Butler's Air One or Brave New World or other experimental thinkings about how we could shape our world in a different way. In doing this, as I say, I'm enormously helped by my Chinese, often much younger friends, because another joy of working in China is that the respect for older people is much greater, and as a result, whereas here, once retired, once a grandfather, I dropped out of people's serious consideration, even among my academic friends, and so I wasn't asked to lecture and my books were not um, considered important. Whereas in China, as you get older, there is ever more respect. And so, um, very small in um, Britain, but bigger in China. And this is obviously very bolstering, but it's also genuine. It's a genuine, not only respect, but care as for parents. So, what I find in China, uh, putting it very crudely, is love. That in China, uh, the difference between friendship and family is, to a large extent, extinguished. So it, as you become a close friend, as I have with a number of young Chinese, I become absorbed as a relative, as an uncle, as a grandfather, as an older brother, whatever is appropriate. And indeed, my nickname, I was told some time ago in China, is Meng Yeye, and that means um, cuddly or friendly grandfather, Yeye. Um, 
And so it's really for the human relations and the human warmth above all that we continue to go. There are other wonderful things. The food is diverse and um, lovely. The countryside is extraordinary and much of it enormously beautiful. Even the arts and crafts and design is uh, extraordinarily good. And the communications are absolutely marvellous now, so it's very easy to move around, very comfortable. Um, there's, uh, it's very peaceful, it's very calm, it's without violence, it's without much aggression. So it's a, a very warm and easy place to visit. From the moment you arrive in the airport, people are friendly and kind and helpful. So in those respects, it's uh, good. But as an academic, if that was all there was, there are other places in the world like that. But to try and get my mind wrapped round a civilization of nearly one and a half billion people with a history of five or six thousand years seriously and a continuous history as in its present shape of over two thousand years is the challenge. And what I hope to do on this um, our 19th visit is to broaden and deepen that knowledge. There are still many things I don't understand about China. For example, I don't understand how the Chinese have managed to both retain a great deal of their deeper cultural grammar, the way they approach the world, from ancient times so that in conversation there are constant allusions to the philosophy of Confucius and Lao Tse or to Tang poetry or to earlier traditions as if they were still alive. So China still feels as if it's um, there 2,000 years ago and yet that is combined with the most sophisticated and advanced um, communication system and other aspects in the world. How do they manage that? How have they managed to go through the biggest industrial revolution in the history of the world in a period of one generation without the ghastly side effects of the British and European uh, revolutions? How do you hold together such a vast landmass and vast number of people without having a political and economic system like ours. So what is the hybrid system of China and what has it got to teach us? I expect the increase in understanding will be incremental. I think I have a number of the fundamental understandings in place through studying Chinese history and talking to people and writing several books, including the most recent, which is on the 19th century travels of a French Lazarist missionary, Abbe Huck, which is about to come out, and which addresses many of these problems I'm talking about. He talks about the combination of the old and the new and the deep grammar of China extremely well. So learning from him and others, I have a picture of a civilization which is simultaneously immensely complex, many, many languages, many cuisines, many different ecologies, many different historical traditions, um, very, very diverse, more diverse than the whole of Western Europe and Eastern Europe combined. On the other hand, united into one China. And that's done by making a few simple principles there as the infrastructure, as the basis, the, the language, the law, the political system, uh, the philosophical system are uniform and universal. And on top of that, there's immense 
diversity. So China is a wonderful example of both change and continuity and a great thought experiment. So I'm gratefully looking forward to this visit and will report back when I return.